Uh, I'm Valerie Sullivan, chair, and I am joined here live stream uh, amongst many stakeholders, as well as our commissioners and staff of the GIC. Uh, here with us today is Bobby Kaplan, our vice chair, Cassandra Roder, our designee for ANF, Rebecca Butler, designee for DOI, uh, Liz Shabbat, uh, Toby Choate, uh, Christy Clenard, uh, Tamara Davis, Joe Gentile, Gerzina Garrard, Patty Jennings, Eileen McNamani, um, Melissa Murphy Rodriguez, Anna Seneco, and Timothy Sullivan. You've got a great uh, board and a good meeting here today, uh, looking into next year's uh, rates and other information moving us forward. At this point, I'd like to entertain a motion uh, to approve our January uh, minutes uh, from the last meeting we held. I think many know we canceled the February meeting to be efficient and to use all of our time appropriately. So at this point, do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, so Bobby with uh, primary, and I think it was Christy for secondary. So I'm yay. Uh, I'm gonna ask our uh, general counsel, uh, Andrew, to take roll call. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Vice Chair Kaplan? Yay. Uh, Commissioner Ritter? Yay. Uh, Commissioner Butler? Yay. Commissioner Shabbat? Present. Commissioner Chapdelaine? He's not here today. Oh, that's and right. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, Commissioner Choate? Yay. Commissioner Kleinard. I don't believe I was at the January meeting, so I will abstain. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Davis? Yay. Commissioner Edmonds? Oh, she's not here yet. Commissioner Gentile? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Giron? Yay. Commissioner Jennings? Yay. Commissioner McEnany? Yay. Commissioner Murphy Rodriguez. Yay. Commissioner Semenko. Uh, I'll abstain. I was not at the January meeting. Commissioner Sullivan. Yes. Motion passes. Majority and two abstentions. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So at this point, I will turn the meeting over to our executive chair. Uh, I have gotten some feedback uh, from our commissioners that they really do like the executive director report sent out ahead. It shows what you're doing, Matt, and uh, we all appreciate it. We also feel it helps us be more efficient and keep the meetings to a defined uh, period of time. So we do appreciate that. So thank you. Happy to do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, members of the commission, members of the public who uh, joined us here today. Um, we have a meeting in essentially two parts. For the first part, we want to wrap up the work um, that has been uh, ongoing over the last several months leading into fiscal year 23. This is the last year of the current uh, five-year procurement. Uh, so we will have a brief report out on the public information sessions that we held in January. We have a vote on the plan design recommendations that we presented to you back in January and a series of votes related to our premium rates for the coming fiscal year. Um, and then we will move to two presentations, uh, no votes on either of those. Um, and the first of those presentations, we wanna start the process uh, that will lead to the new procurement for our employee assistance program, our EAP called mass for you um, uh, In that presentation, we will essentially be expressing our intent to you to procure an, a consultant to assist us um, for that. I think it'll be a relatively brief presentation, a recap of the current program and utilization. The uh, second uh, presentation and the last uh, substantive item on the agenda will be a presentation from our general counsel, Andrew Stern, on our procurement rules as we prepare for the release 
of um, the RFR for our health insurance plan. So that's the game plan for today. All right, looks Moving good. On. <clears throat> Thank you. Moving on to the executive director's report, start with the calendar as we do. Um, we will be back again in just three short weeks um, on March 24th to present on our strategy for the health plan RFR and to close out the engagement process with a final report on those activities. Uh, as you'll see, we have no meeting in April per the normal cadence of our, of our meetings. In May, we'll have the routine votes on trust funds in preparation for the coming fiscal year and start the procurement of our, uh, the process for our FSA program. Um, and then in June, we'll come back with a recap of the FY23 annual enrollment, vote on our EAP consultant that we're presenting today. Um, and then we break for the summer and prepare for a busy fall where we will have um, votes, um, you know, the, the, the real core work will be votes around the procurement for both the health plans and PBMs. So that's what we project through the end of the calendar year. Any questions on that? Uh, the only thing, uh, yeah, I see that I see the health fairs are here under annual enrollment. So uh, I just want to make sure uh, we touch on that a little bit, if not this meeting, next meeting. Yep. All right, moving on to the rest of the executive director's report. So there's a lot in this month's report. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the compliments on it. It's uh, um, we're, we're, we're happy to take questions on any element of the report, but I do wanna focus just a minute on the human resources update. Um, commissioners, Commissioner Choate and others have asked in the past about steps that we're taking, that I'm taking to ensure that the organization is uh, structured in a way that prepares us to achieve our strategic objectives. And over the course of the last really two years, we've been doing just that. Um, so of course, early on, uh, we brought in Erica Chabelli as deputy executive director Emily Williams is chief of staff. We talked, I think at the last meeting or meeting prior um, about bringing on Leslie Montero who's brought a lot of energy to the communications end. Um, but we've made several other changes. Um, many of them um, are changes in title and job descriptions and compensation that really catch up to the reality of a number of key members of our team stepping up, taking on new responsibilities, um, that have really been necessary to keep our, our work moving forward. So with Denise uh, Donnelly's departure and the procurement and strategy side, we've taken steps um, in that area to leverage uh, really deep talent that we already have there by expanding the roles of Margaret Anschutz, Cameron McBean, and Janine Dewar, um, and Jim Rust, who now oversees that unit. Um, Margaret's new role will expand upon her leadership of our data analytics function to include uh, strategic initiatives and healthcare policy. And both Cameron and Janine's roles have expanded to include leading our various procurements and as major contributors on the strategy front. So um, I, I love seeing how this team works together and works with us, me and others on the rest of the senior team. Um, We've also, in the uh, operations unit, promoted Chuck O'Brien into a new management position that's focused on strategic technology and modernization initiatives that we've discussed here before and which we'll have um, a update on uh, with the commission relatively soon. Chuck now works closely with the operations and IT leadership and will focus on training and support of internal and external users of our new tools, our new IT systems, and we're backfilling Chuck's old role so that we can uh, support him in his new role. Um, in addition, as employees have um, continued to work remotely over the last two years, uh, Ruth Oliveira on the human resources team has been a true team player uh, jumping in to cover a wide variety of administrative functions beyond her HR day job. So um, we've asked her um, to 
uh, take on a, a new role um, as HR and administrative services specialist. Um, Tansy Helmke, who you may recall, um, some of you may have interacted with her. She came in as a temporary executive assistant, uh, but she's agreed to stay on full time on the staff as a paralegal to support Andrew and Mark. We have a substantial amount of contracting work and many other important um, initiatives in the legal area. So her help is greatly appreciated. Um, and then finally, we have two new hires filling vacancies in the operations unit. Milagros Arias Mendoza, who goes by Millie, um, joined us uh, just this week. And Nicole Conward will arrive in the middle of March from Harvard Pilgrim. Uh, so pulling this all together has been and continues to be uh, quite a lot of work. Brock uh, Weidenheimer, our HR director, has been working closely with Emily Williams, our chief of staff, to move all these things along. So. Um, I hope that gives you a, a sense of how we've adapted, adjusted, changed the organization, but really invested in talent that we already have um, by expanding roles. So I'll stop there. Happy to take questions on any of that or uh, any other aspect of the, of the director's report. Yeah, I don't see any questions. Uh, so you can continue to move on. Just want to congratulate uh, all those who have uh, been promoted or are in new roles and appreciate that and hope you are enjoying uh, the, the new uh, positions and the leadership of uh, the team. I see Bobby has her hand up. So go ahead, Bobby. Yes, I just wanted to, you know, congratulate everyone. I think that change is Great, and I just want to give a little shout out to Ruth Oliveira, who I've known for a really long time, to congratulate her. Um, she's a, been a hard worker for years, and it's nice, very nice to see her being uh, recognized. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Bobby. We will be sure to pass that on to Ruth and her, and her boss. Let's move along. All right. Um, so agenda item three, our public listening sessions for this, I'll turn it over to uh, Eric Shabelli, our deputy executive director, uh, to report out on the public listening sessions that we had in January. Erica. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I have a quick report planned for you today. I just want to make sure that my notes are right in front of me so I don't misspeak and I'm looking at the camera. So give me just one second because right now all I can see are your lovely faces. So I'm also managing the meeting in the background. <laughs> I was going to I was going to yeah. say that she's she's multitasking here. Really I have three screens which you can't see right now. <laughs> so okay. Um, as Matt mentioned, uh, we had three sessions uh, in January, and these are our annual uh, public listening sessions. This is the second year um, that we held them virtually. Um, the first thing I'd like to do, though, is to thank commissioners for their attendance at these sessions. We always appreciate having you present uh, to hear directly from our members. Um, I'd also like to thank the GIC staff who, as always, stepped up to the task and are responsible for making these sessions um, a, su a success. Um, the slide before you provides the basic information on the sessions. Uh, we had three sessions across one week. Each was held via Zoom and was well attended, as you can see reflected here with the number of registrants for each session. Um, the question and answer function in Zoom was open and available throughout the entirety of the presentation. Uh, so folks could just, you know, as, as questions came to them, uh, throw them right in the Q&A function. Um, and the GIC staff did a truly stellar job of rapidly responding to over 150 questions in writing as they were submitted. Um, the GIC um, during, so for the GIC provided a presentation, which was about 40 minutes long and began with an overview of the GIC, including its governing structure and its funding mechanism. Uh, but the real substance of the presentation focused on premium rates and plan design, as well as retirement and Medicare. 
We also made it a point to review our upcoming health benefit procurement to ensure that members were aware of the timeline, process, and the GIC's general strategy. We also took the opportunity to highlight the need for those enrolled in Fallon plans to choose a new plan during the enrollment period. Finally, we closed the presentation with verbal Q&As where staff selected questions that had been previously submitted in the Q&A function that we thought would be applicable and useful to the larger audience. Uh, the blue box in the slide provides a few themes that we found uh, in the questions that members asked, uh, but I'd like to go into further detail with several of the most common examples. So first, we were frequently asked when benefit statement letters and benefit decisions, decision guides would be available. And we noted in the, in the sessions that we were aiming to get both out earlier than we did last year. And I'm happy to report that we did get benefit statement letters out about three weeks earlier this year. Um, you should, they should be arriving this week if they haven't arrived already. And we're slated for benefit decision guides to be on the very same trajectory, so a bit earlier than last year. So big thanks to um, Leslie, uh, Maureen, Cameron, Paul, and really the whole team, uh, Donna as well, for making this possible. Um, second, we attempted to preempt a number of the common retirement and Medicare questions that we typically receive in these sessions by including a thorough overview uh, from Director of Operations, Paul Murphy. Uh, we still received many retirement questions, even though Paul touched on plenty of them, uh, but they were most commonly about uh, the eligibility of spouses and turning 65. Um, and third, as with other years, uh, we were asked about the potential of a plus one option in addition to the family and individual options. Um, while we explain that it's something that we review annually, we noted that at present, the introduction of a plus one option would cause a disproportionate impact or increase on those with more dependents, since the GIC membership tend to cover, uh, tends to have more dependents than, than most plan sponsors, including other government entities. So those are just a few examples of the frequently asked questions we received. Uh, I plan to work with Leslie Montero and Mike Berry to compile those questions into an FAQ document uh, in advance of annual enrollment, which begins on April 6th. And I am happy to take any questions. I don't see any, uh, Erica. Nor do I. I, I do think the written questions are pretty impressive that we're able to mm -hmm. see them in real time. And I liked that you, you were able to mm -hmm. respond to them. I, I thought that was, you know, definitely uh, an upgrade from in-person sessions. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was surprised that some mm -hmm. of our participants are not aware that the GIC is actually the body that manages, provides, supports all of our constituents. Uh, so I think in a couple of the questions, I pointed that out to the staff to, to see if we can let stakeholders and our constituents know that it's really the GIC in the state that's providing these services. And while we love our health plans, uh, the health plans uh, are, are administrators of the benefits we provide. It's a nuance, but I think oh, over time, I'd love to see uh, I'd love to see our stakeholders and, and constituents know the good work that our staff and our state do on their behalf. So I think you guys did a great job of answering some of those mm -hmm. questions. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Yeah, we, we made it a point to include kind of the governing structure and a, an explanation of what it means to be self-insured um, in hopes that we were that we would be able to get to the membership and explain truly how the GIC functions. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. yeah. No. Question from uh, Vice Chair Kaplan. Yes, I just wanted to, first of all, compliment everyone who uh, worked on these sessions, the, and unfortunately, I was only able to attend the first one, but it was so well done um, that I just, um, I, you, all of you did such a great job and, and explaining so that the questions were, you know, were really focused on other stuff, right? More 
perhaps more individual, what people are really interested in. I was curious whether anyone commented either in the chat or, um, you know, when they wrote, um, when they submitted questions regarding the sessions, the time of day or, or anything, because I see that noontime, which is lunchtime for most state employees, right? They, that was the, you know, largest attendance. So I'm very curious if people said, made any comments regarding the time or their preferences for next year. Uh, no, actually, we hadn't received any comments. As you can see from uh, the slide, we really tried to um, tackle a, a number of different kind of um, pockets in the day so that we could get folks whenever they were available. So whether it was after work, slightly before work or in the middle of the day. Um, but we, no, we didn't receive any comments about preferences for next year. Um, I think part of that may be due, in, due to the fact that we do also have each of these sessions available, recorded on our YouTube page. So they're really accessible at any time. Um, and throughout the slide deck there, we provide a link to our contact form so that if folks have questions, like let's say they're, they're watching the video after the fact, they're still able to reach out to us and ask their questions. Um, that contact form actually was really helpful as it has been in years past um, so that we can direct folks who may have more personal questions uh, to the contact form so that we're making sure we're, we're protecting their, their privacy as patients and members. Thanks again. It was really very well done. Hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, can we tell how many people view the streaming uh, on YouTube post the live session? And do we look at that? I'm sure we can. I have not looked at it, um, but I'm, I'm sure Leslie's ears are perking up right now <laughs> listening to that question. So I'll be sure to chat with her about it later and see if we can get some uh, data on, on what the, the analytics are there. Yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah. So if you could you know, send us all a message just to let us know how engaged right. our constituents are, it would be mm -hmm. helpful to get that information. So thanks. Sure, no problem. Okay, moving right along. I just want to quickly thank Erica for all her work on this and her team. She thanked a bunch of people. And um, we, you know, one of the things that makes this work so well, especially the response to the real time questions, is that we have a we have a, a little army of our staff like ready to go working together behind the scenes to take on various questions, pulling out questions that we think have a, an important um, that that more that the broader audience may be interested to hear. So it's so thank you, Madam Vice Chair, for the compliment. I want to share that compliment with the rest of the team, especially Erica, who pulled it all together. Thanks, Matt. And I can confirm that Wolfley is as we speak looking at those YouTube numbers. So we'll we'll get them to you shortly. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you all. Uh, thanks, Erica. So moving on to agenda item four, Jim Rust and I will briefly review the plan design recommendation that we presented to you all in January um, and ask for a vote uh, to proceed. Next slide. So I won't spend a lot of time on these slides. They are identical to the ones that we presented to you in January, but a, a brief reminder that we are proposing no changes to copays or deductibles for this, the last year of the five-year procurement cycle. However, we are proposing to add a, a suite of family and community-based services to meet the behavioral health needs of children and adolescents. This aligns with the longtime um, work at, at Mass Health and with the, uh, with the Children's Behavioral Health Initiative and more recently with work done by the Division of Insurance. Next slide. So as we noted then um, in January, that uh, our plans uh, are already covering some of these services. So we expect, um, and we expect utilization of them to be very low, although these are very important services to the small number that need them. Consequently, the financial impact on our rates is very, very modest. So we heard nothing but positive comments about this in the public information session um, and, uh, would ask that the commission support it with an affirmative vote. 
I, I do just want to also note that Jim Rust is available if there are any questions. Other members of his team, Vince Kane from uh, the actuary from Willis Towers Watson, who assisted us with this. So we're happy to field any questions should you have them. I don't see any questions. I do believe that the commission and the staff have done a really good job at uh, preserving uh, the last year of our procurement. So no changes. So I think uh, we are appreciative of that. And I caveat the no changes with uh, the mental health parity change that we are now about to vote on. Uh, so at this point, I still don't see any questions. So we'll uh, entertain, I will entertain a motion to approve the proposed plan design changes as presented. Uh, so I see- I do have a quick question. I'm okay. sorry. Um, which is, is that going to go through um, uh, the behavioral health providers or, or is this change going to go through, um, is it medical? Is it considered uh, medical, so if someone has a child who, you know, needs a diagnosis or has been diagnosed and needs treatment, is that um, they would contact the providers, right, or behavioral health providers? Well, it it is it is it's a benefit on the medical benefit, mm -hmm. so it's covered through the health plans. Um, and because we have um, the behavioral health benefit carved in with the plans, yeah. um, you know, each plan will have its own approach. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that we benefit from the fact that the Division of Insurance um, moved on this before we did. So mm -hmm. each of the plans has, over the last two plus years, has been able to sort of iron out the kinks to contract with different providers of these services if they did not have those in place already. Okay. Um, so th that's, I think that's the way it's, that's the mm -hmm. way it's set up to, to play out for our members. So like any other service, should they have questions about their coverage or what providers are in network for mm -hmm. the plan, they should contact the health plan. Okay, thank you. Thanks, yeah. it's a terrific initiative. So thank you very much. You bet. All right, thanks Bobby for that question and clarification. I don't see any more questions. So at this uh, time, I will entertain a motion to approve the proposed plan design as uh, presented to us today. So moved. Second. Okay. So at this point, I will hand it over to Andrew for roll call, but I approve this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Kaplan? Uh, yes. Uh, Commissioner or designee Rodier? Yay. Uh, Commissioner Butler? Yay. Commissioner Chabot? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Choate? Yes. yes. Commissioner Clenard? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Gentile? Yes. Commissioner McEnany? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Murphy Rodriguez? Yes. Commissioner uh, Timothy Sullivan? Yes. And Commissioner Garand? Yes. It's, uh, I'm sure the vote passes unanimously. All right, well, that's terrific, thank you. Let's move along. Thank you all for that at this point, um, hand it over to uh, Jim Rust and his team uh, to walk us through the FY23 subsidies and rates. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everyone. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so I'm gonna introduce Cameron McBean who manages our 
ancillary benefits such as dental, among other things, and he's going to walk us through the, the dental rates. So, Cameron. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, commissioners. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just as a quick bit of uh, table setting, um, the rates for our uh, dental premiums are contractually set um, because they are a fully insured product. Uh, product, and we are in the second year of the new contract cycle with MetLife, as well as our vision provider, uh, Davis Vision. We're going to uh, start with the retiree dental plan. Uh, the table below, which, uh, as we mentioned, has been corrected from the uh, version that was initially sent out, the uh, fiscal 23 rates will be lower than initially provided to the commission. Um, and still less than they were in the last contract cycle. So these are the rates for the retirees. And we can move on to the next slide, please. For our active population, this, these are state employees who are not covered by collective bargaining. Um, and again, these are premiums that were included uh, within the contract that was agreed to with MetLife. So you see those slight increases uh, year over year for both of the dental plan options. Next slide. The uh, active vision plan is a self funded uh, plan. So there are ASO fees and uh, claims experience baked into these working rates that you uh, see here. So then if we move on to the next slide, we then combine the dental and vision rates uh, or premiums together for the total premiums for our active population on the, on the combined dental and vision plan. And those plans, if you have one, you have the other, they are not severable. And then finally, if we move on to the last slide, uh, because employees only pay a portion of those premiums, these will be the actual uh, monthly contribution rates for those members on the GIC's combined dental and vision plan. So these are the member share of those combined premiums. Are there any questions? Okay, I believe that wraps me up and we can move on to the next slide. Okay. Thank you, Cameron, appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk about the subsidies for the EGR and RMT, elderly government retirees and uh, retired municipal teacher populations. Next slide, please. This will require a vote, by the way. Um, so for those of you who have, have been through this process before, you may recall that historically we have subsidized the rates for the EGRs. Um, in a quick overview, the EGRs contributed to a reserve over the years when the products were fully insured. And this subsidy is returning the money that they put into those reserves back to them to impact their rates. Um, for, there are only seven EGRs now remaining in this population. So we, are, so we are looking to subsidize their rates and slightly lower their rates compared to FY22. Uh, Jim? Yes. Can you just enunciate that uh, one more time for me? Uh, seven, 70, how many? Seven, seven EGRs, seven elderly government rates. Um, retirees. These are folks that would have retired, I believe, um, in, the, in the late 1950s. So most of these are survivors uh, mm -hmm. or spouses of, of those folks. So, um, next slide, please. Our proposal is to use approximately 3,000 of the 61,000 in the EGR rate stabilization fund and 1,000 of the 62,000 in the EGR CIC rate stabilization fund. Um, the combined effect of these subsidies would be a modest decrease in the EGR's premiums. Uh, this, is, this is consistent with prior year's use of these funds. Mm -hmm. um, next slide, please. And finally, the table below, if we were to, if we were to approve the use of these subsidies and, and approve the subsequent health care rates that will appear later in today's presentation, um, this, this is what the what the monthly premiums would be for the EGRs. And I should mention that they are all in the Medicare plan. So 
that, that is the effective rate for this population. Um, with that, I know I went through that fairly quickly, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, we would we respectfully respectfully ask for you to approve the motion to use these funds. Let's see any questions. And I I have to say I have a high degree of respect for our ERGs and their longevity. And so uh, I think that uh, it's great. Um, so at this point, I will entertain a motion uh, to approve as so presented. Matt, Madam Chair. Yes. Madam Chair, point Not of order. Um, in reviewing the prior motion, before we make the, the next one, um, Commissioner Sinenko uh, was not on the slide and missed her opportunity to vote. So I'd like to allow her a chance to vote on the plan design before we move on to the further votes. Oh, thank you, Andrew. So Commissioner Sinenko, um, uh, what, would your vote, what was your vote on the proposed plan design? I approve. Thanks, okay. Andrew. Thank you. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Anna. So on uh, back to the ERG contributions. Sure. Uh, we can go to the next slide. The motion is on the next slide. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I still don't see any, and I think this is a great initiative that we do for our, our ERGs. So um, at this point, I'll entertain a motion uh, to approve spending from the elderly government retirees fund, uh, rate stabilization uh, and uh, CIC reserves to reduce the FY23 premiums as presented. So I have a motion. Okay. And do I have a second? A second. Okay. Uh, so at this point I will vote, uh, I approve and I'll pass it over to Andrew for roll call please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Kaplan. Yes. Commissioner Roeder. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner Shabbat. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Choate. Yes. Commissioner Kleinard. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Gentile. Yes. Commissioner McEnany. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Murphy Rodriguez. Yes. Commissioner Sullivan. Yes. Commissioner Garand. Yes. Garand, I'm sorry. Uh, no Commissioner problem. Sinenko. Yes. Uh, the vote unanimous. That's terrific. Thank you. Uh, let's move along. Thank you. Um, next is the retired municipal teachers subsidies. Uh, next slide, please. So similar to the EGRs, the RMTs have contributed to reserves over the years um, that were attached to the fully insured products that they were participating in. So that's how this, these reserves were built up in the same way that the EGRs were. Um, one difference is that there are many more RMTs and also this is not um, a stagnant population. In other words, the EGRs, there won't be any more EGRs, but the RMTs, the RMTs are a fluid population. Um, similar to the EGRs, we were making a recommendation to use these reserve funds to subsidize the RMTs um, premiums. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, here's the specifics of what we're proposing. Um, there are more reserves associated with the RMTs, so we're asking if we could to approve the use of 1.65 million to offset to offset from the um, RMT, excuse me, 1.65 million to of the RMT rate stabilization reserve to offset premiums for FY23, and 485,000 from the RMT rate stabilization reserve, and um, approximately 15,000 from the RMT CIC rate stabilization reserve. So these are the three reserves that are associated with the RMTs. They are they are separated, but they will all achieve the same the same goal of reducing premiums for the RMTs. Um, next slide, please. And again, similar to the EGRs, if you were to approve the use of these reserves and subsequently approve the healthcare rates that you'll be voting on later in this meeting, um, these will be the rates for the RMTs. And I should also make a note um, that 
this will be the final use of the RMT reserve. So we've successfully returned this money to the RMTs after this after this subsidy and exhausted the reserve. So that's um, I think that's that's a good news story that we've successfully moved that money back to the RMT population. Um, and with that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, we respectfully ask for your approval. I don't see any questions, but I have a question, Jim. When you say we've successfully uh, replaced or uh, returned Return the money, money right. mm -hmm. what will be the impact then on rates next year for our RMTs? So these these plans are reserved. There's a lot of plans and a lot of different reserves here, but they're, they're the impact could be anywhere from 10 cents on some of the plans to um, up to $20 on some of the plans, depending on what the increase is next year, right? So there's two moving there's two moving variables there, what the actual plan increase rates are that you'll vote on later for FY24 when we, when we don't have these reserves, and then the, the impact of the reduction of the reserves not being available. So we have over the years tried to make a glide path so this wouldn't be a kind of a cliff situation. So we've used that's why it wasn't all returned in one year because it would have been, you could have gone say just for illustrative purposes from a zero premium to a full premium, right? So this has been metered out over the years by staff, including staff before my time here at the GIC to make sure we had a nice smooth process to get to the end of the reserves. Okay, well, I think it's great that we've gotten these uh, monies back to those who rightfully deserve them. Um, so thank you. Uh, so Bobby, I see you have a question. Yes, I have a question. I'm curious if we weren't able to do this this year, what would the premiums be? Jim, do you know? They would be the what you will vote on the next section of this meeting. So they would just have full clock. They would have whatever their share of premiums would, would be for retirees. Would be, they would just pay the full amount. Okay. So, so these are subsidies to mm -hmm. what would be the full, the right. full cost rate for these members. Mm -hmm. Not unique premium situation. I don't see any uh, other questions, so let's move on. Uh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. So at this point, I will entertain a motion to approve the spending of the RMT's rate stabilization and the CIC reserves to reduce the FY23 premiums as presented. Do I have a motion? So moved. Uh, second. Second. All right. Seconded. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. So at this point, I will vote approved and I'll pass it on to Andrew. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Com Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Kathleen. Yes. Commissioner Ro Roder. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner Chabot. Yes. Commissioner Chatelain. I'm sorry, Commissioner Choate. Yes. Commissioner Klenard. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Gentile. Yes. Commissioner McEnany. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Murphy Rodriguez. Yes. Commissioner Tim Sullivan. Yes. Commissioner Sinenko? Yes. And Commissioner Garan. Is he still on? Maybe he's on mute. I can't tell. Commissioner Garan? Maybe we believe can... you're on mute. Yeah. Maybe we can come back to him. Yeah, yeah, he did mention earlier that he was having a couple of issues with his computer. Yes. Um, the vote passes unanimously. Uh, went to the yeah. tech. I'm sorry. I think it's going on and off. Um, are you voting affirmative? Oh, we lost yeah. again. Okay, good. Vote passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I very much appreciate the vote. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. 
So I'm going to introduce Vince Kane, who's um, some of you who have seen before, um, is, is our actuarial consultant with WTW, who helps us tremendously with a lot of work on developing rates for, um, for our fiscal year. And he's going to walk us through the rate development process. And um, at the end of this section, we will vote, we will have a vote on the rates. So Vince. Thanks, Jim. And uh, good morning, Madam Chair and, and commissioners and um, GIC staff. Um, so very much consistent with last year, I'll be walking through the process that Willis Towers Watson engages in to develop the full cost premiums for the next fiscal year. Um, you know, we'll, we're going to walk through the non-Medicare plans as well as the Medicare plans, have a discussion on the proposed rates, per, also sh show some illustrative contributions based on different uh, member cost shares, and uh, put it to a vote all at the end of this section. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, we work over a span of about six or seven months with folks at the GIC, all the health plan partners, the pharmacy benefit managers, ESI and CVS, to collect um, data for the most recent complete fiscal year and develop estimates of the full cost associated with the services that GIC members are expected to use in the um, upcoming year. So that reflects both the medical utilization, pharmacy utilization, as well as administrative fees or, or fixed retention components, um, which are you know, what the um, health plans collect to actually administer the, the plans and curate the networks. So um, you know, the non-Medicare products are for active employees and the retirees who are not eligible for Medicare, while the Medicare plans, which are the med sub plans and the Tufts Medicare Advantage plan, are for the, the retirees. Now, we will be talking about sort of status quo pricing, which means looking at the, um, the total expected budget and the per plan increases, assuming the same uh, plan partners and the same plan choices for FY23. Uh, there is one um, you know, exception here, and that's for Fallon. So Fallon has decided to exit the commercial market and so the select and direct plans will no longer be offered for FY23. Um, we also discussed the plan design changes already. There is nothing really on the table except what you've just voted for related to mental health parity for the non-Medicare plans for FY23, and there are no changes for any of the Medicare plans for FY23. Next slide. So, you know, over the span of the six or seven months here, there are a lot of parties involved in the process. Uh, we've got that color coded. The blue sections represent uh, Willis Harris Watson working with the health plans and PBMs to collect data. The purple sections here are really work that is, is led by the actuarial team at Willis Harris Watson. The uh, yellow or orange section uh, is work related to incorporating or estimating the cost for potential plan design changes. The uh, green section are the important commission meetings where we you know, first propose the uh, status quo overall average increase, um, outline the uh, potential plan design changes, vote them in, and then you know, the culmination is to vote on the actual rates. This year, there's a, been a, you know, a little bit of a, a different approach with the uh, postponement or cancellation rather of the February meeting, uh, given the, the plan design changes are not material um, as far as their impact to the rates. And so we've incorporated the vote for the rates in, in the plan design changes into this one meeting this time around. But typically there would be a meeting in February to vote on the rates, um, sorry, vote on the plan design changes before the impact of those changes can be incorporated into the rates. Uh, and then, you know, of course, we also discussed the GIC public meetings, uh, which occur in January, um, which, you know, serve the purpose of informing the, the constituents and members of the plans on uh, changes upcoming for the next fiscal year. So a lot of, you know, what we see here in the beginning of the process is related to updating our pricing models that are used to project FY21 claims experience to FY23. And one of the most important aspects of that is developing our trend assumptions. So the, the trend assumptions are worked through um, with our plan partners 
for both medical and pharmacy and represent the expected increases, not only due to unit cost pressure and inflation, um, but also utilization and um, potential mix of services toward higher costs, um, you know, services or new technologies or, or treatments. After we incorporate all of that data into our models, we also work with the PBMs to estimate rebates, which are a large component of the rate development um, since they're an offset to the full cost premiums, as well as EGWIP reimbursements, which are really the federal Part D subsidies um, associated with the, the MedSup and the Medicare Advantage plans. Um, in the sort of December timeframe in a typical year, we'd, we'd work through estimates for potential plan design changes, and we did that this past year for the uh, mental health parity changes consistent with the DOI mandate from 2018. We proposed those in January, and um, you know, now we've kind of worked through our final adjustments to rebates and AGWEP to um, propose the rates that you're about to see in the following slides. Next slide. So what, what are the full cost premiums? Um, I think you know everyone knows this by now, uh, but it is the um, required or expected cost to cover all eligible claims for both medical services and prescription drugs, as well as those administrative fees for the upcoming fiscal year 23. These full cost premiums do not include the member um, cost sharing at the point of care, for example, copays and deductibles. And you know, most members, of course, are, are paying only a portion of this. And uh, if you move to the next slide, you can see that the, um, the percentages outlined here reflect the fact that you know, depending on state law or contracted agreements at the municipality level, um, you know, the full cost premiums are split. So the Commonwealth pays a share and the employee or the retiree pays uh, a smaller share ranging from 10 to 25%. Hey, um I, I don't mean to interrupt you, Vince, but do we have the breakdown of what percent of our employees or retirees pay the 10, 15, 20, and 25? I do think uh, we've seen that before. I'm just wondering if it fluctuates every year and what degree as we hire more people. Good question. I do not look at that level of data. I don't know if Jim or someone from the GIC could speak to that distribution. There won't be any uh new members joining at the lower contribution rate below 25 percent because that's based on you know the the most recent uh mandate um paul could i'm sure could, if, uh, if he were uh on board could tell us the exact year i don't have that off the top of my head but any new members that join the gic would be joining at, joining at that 25 percent rate currently I actually think it was 2003 that it was last changed by statute, where Correct. it's now 25% for all hires after July 1st, 2003. That is correct, Commissioner Kaplan. After July 1st, 2003, all state employees pay 25. Retirees are still at 10, 15, and 20, but any new retirees after 2009 pay 20%. So 20. there's no, as Cameron said, going into the lower contributions, it's really the 20 and 25 for both active and retired. So Paul, if you could say that again, maybe a different way. So anybody who's retiring this year, the statute from 2003 is at a 20% contribution for retirees? The no, statute from sorry. 2003 is for active state employees. If you were hired before 2003 as a state employee, you pay 20%. If you were hired as a state employee after July 1st, 2003, you pay 25%. Okay. On the retiree side, if you retired before 1994, you pay 10%. If you retired before 2009, you pay 15%. Retirees after 2009 are pay 20% right now. So every retiree that retires since 2009 is paying the 20% contribution. Okay, so maybe you might be able to provide us a slide as follow-up on numbers and percent and some of that breakdown just to help the commissioners and our sure. constituents understand, you know, the contribution that the state makes uh, across, uh, you know, a, a blend. Andrew, sure. I see you have your hand up. 
Yes, Madam Chair, I just want to clarify, this is something, contribution ratios are set in the budget every year. So this is subject to change every single year. Um, it's, it's usually in our line item. Um, okay, thank you. All right, next slide. I apologize, Vince, for breaking your flow, but I believe our uh, constituents uh, may have had the same question, so thanks. No worries. So, um, you know, when we talk about who takes on the risk, for the most part, uh, it is a self-insured arrangement for the GIC and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is taking on that risk for the active employees and the non-Medicare retirees, which means if the claims in any given year exceed the working rates that we develop, um, the state needs to seek additional funds from the general fund or make a supplemental uh, budget request. So the health plan partners are not taking on any risk in this regard, and that includes, you know, for catastrophic claims. Um, so the the benefits or advantages of an approach like this is that the GIC is large enough to withstand, you know, potential cash flow issues related to high cost claims, which, you know, many small plan sponsors are not, and also is able to, um, you know, avoid paying some of the risk and profit charges that are that would otherwise be built into a fully insured premium as a retention components. So the, the one exception here is the Medicare Advantage plan with uh, Tufts. The medical portion of that premium rate is fully insured. And you know each, each year we work with Tufts to um, understand the drivers of the increase for the upcoming year and to um, you know, negotiate and control the cost increases related to that portion of the premium. Next slide. So, you know, we're about to get to the, the overall average result, but I did want to talk about some of the drivers of what we're seeing uh, for the total premium increases by plan for non-Medicare and Medicare. Um, what we're basically seeing is that trend assumptions are higher. So there's a few factors in, in play, but you know, when we look at how the FY21 claims experience emerged relative to what we expected, you know, last year, uh, it, it came in higher. And, you know, that's sort of despite the pandemic and, and that fiscal year of experience represents the 12 years, uh, sorry, the 12 months from July 2020 to June 2021. Uh, we also collect information on trend and the trend assumptions that we use to project that claims experience forward are also higher. So not only uh, for the same time period for FY21 to FY22 um, that was used in last year's pricing, that trend is a little bit higher, but also the FY22 to FY23 trend um, represented sort of an uptick. And you know, we already talked about sort of the components that Utilization is, is a fairly you know, small component of the overall trend. It's mostly unit costs, which typically represents 50% to two thirds of the total trend assumption. And the average trend assumption across all plans for non-Medicare and Medicare was about 6.4%. Uh, we we're also seeing just general cost pressure and, and it's manifested in the unit um, cost trend due to inflation and, and provider consolidation. So, you know, everyone's been experiencing inflation lately. When you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the component of CPI that's related to medical, it's actually trending a little bit lower than a lot of other components, for example, food and energy. Um, the last 12 months through January had a CPI of about 2.7%, which is consistent with historical levels, but we're seeing a pretty um, significant spike in sort of the monthly inflation factors um, for you know the most recent three months. Now that's reflected in our trend assumptions because when we work with the health plans, they are basically giving us trends that are reflective of their negotiated contracts with providers. So you know th they have insight into multi-year contracts and are able to project for us the um, expected unit costs and what that means for an overall inflationary factor going into the next fiscal year. They're also able to estimate trend uh, mix components. So, you know, there's a mixed component of trend, which is typically about 1% that is due to, you know, folks using higher cost providers uh, for the same services from one year to the next, 
or potentially using new um, treatments and technologies. Uh, COVID, of course, is also um, included here. The claims experience base includes direct COVID claims as well as costs for testing and uh, vaccinations. And you know that's expected to continue to some degree in the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and finally, you know, pharmaceutical companies, of course, are, are um, you know, raising prices and, and the single largest trend component for all of our projections is for pharmacy. Now, Massachusetts, um, you know, is reporting data on this. CHIA supports the Health Policy Commission. The 2021 um, claims uh, cost trend report came out uh, last fall, which had data through 2019. And we are seeing continuing, uh, you know, increases that are above the cost control target. And, you know, there's a lot of drivers, the, the last drivers that consider 2019, I think some of the um, commercial trend increases were attributed to uh, outpatient and professional services. And that's really manifesting itself in the claims data that we use for pricing as well. Uh, but the single largest driver, like I said, is pharmacy. Yep. Oh, hi, Anna. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if Anna could ask her question, that would be great, Vince. Yeah, sorry, Hi, I can't Anna. see who's got their hands raised. No problem. Thank you. I not to. I just am curious. Um, so the the this conversation is so helpful, sort of. I think to understand what is driving um, healthcare costs. And question I have is, I mean, you made some really important points there about. Um, you know, inflation and in particular, like the consumer products inflation is different than the medical cost inflation. And also it reflects um, multi-year contracts that the plans have with their providers. And that makes me think that there could be like a real delay in some ways in feeling the effects of inflation in the health insurance premiums, because like if we're still dealing with old contracts for another year, then we, we sort of get the benefits of the lower inflationary period. But then once they renegotiate, it could go up. And do you have any sense for that as to whether um, the con when contracts, these multi-year contracts are renegotiated for our plans and whether we're, we're really feeling that higher inflation yet in the prices or if it's still to come? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we don't press to get proprietary contractual details from the plans but we could certainly press to get more information related to the portion or percentage of their contracts that are up for negotiation uh, this year versus next, et cetera. I would expect uh, many of the contracts are complicated. Um, there could be resharing provisions um, as opposed to just fee-for-service increases in services, and they're likely you know, multi-year. Uh, but we could ask them to give us insights into that. They are truly reflecting what they know at the time um, so, you know, if they're currently in negotiations with a large hospital system or provider group and that's not complete, um, you know, we don't have any insight into what the immediate short term pressure might be, uh, nor do we know what um, might happen two years out. But the sense that I'm getting is that uh, costs are going up, you know, costs are going to drive a lot of the increases that we're seeing. Um, you know, that's consistent also with what I'm looking at when I review the merge market. Uh, rate filings, the product increases are going up for rates, um, you know, for Q1 2022 in the order of 6.9% relative to last year at 7.9. So it is a slight decrease. But then when I look at Q2 2022, it's up for a number of the carriers, the, the requested rate increase by one or two points. So I do think there's pressure on rates and it is certainly driven by unit costs. Um, you know, most of the underwriting processes, including the ones that we use, aren't assuming sort of additional um, utilization increases due to COVID. Um, we're kind of taking FY21 as the new base, acknowledging the fact that there is you know, going to be more COVID claims in that period, um, but there's also kind of still some suppressed demand or um, utilization of services, and the, the net effects of both of those will be to you know, wash out each other a little bit going forward. Um, but yeah, we we will um, try to get more information on that. That's great. I think that, that anything about the timing of the renegotiations is, is interesting and helpful. And I should say also that, of course, a huge driver of these unit costs is just provider consolidation and raising rates, not because of inflation, but, but just 
because of the consolidation market power. I will just note briefly, thank you for the for the excellent question, Commissioner Senenko. I, I would say um, the RFR provides us a really good opportunity to dig into some of these things a little bit more in a little bit more detail. In a lot more detail, actually. Okay, next slide. Our vice chair has a question. Yes, I have a question regarding, I'd like to know, Vince, what you think about the, you know, all the procedures and the visits that have been deferred, that were deferred during COVID, um, what impact that will have, like for this quarter, perhaps, um, on the cl on claim utilization, you know, is that, do you anticipate that there's going to be a huge increase because of all the, um, deferred, you know, procedures. Yeah, I, I would say that when we had the first initial wave of COVID and the, um, you know, claim suppression that was driven actually by a lot of the systems canceling elective procedures, a good portion of the utilization came back in the months following in 2020. But as you can see, looking at, you know, Jim's financial updates with each commission meeting, the utilization levels still haven't fully reached um, you know, what we would have expected for pre-COVID levels. I think that's going to be aggravated a bit by the Omicron variant as, you know, again, in late November and through December, a number of procedures that, well, were, were uh, just more discretionary elective procedures were pushed off. Now that will be an immediate impact to this year's budget. It's not really in the claims experience base that we're using for pricing, nor do we expect it to yield like a big bump up in utilization for FY23. Um, if there is a push in, for additional utilization that goes into the next fiscal year, um, I would expect that that would, would wear off pretty quickly absent, you know, any new variants or other, you know, external factors that continue the pandemic's impact on, on use of health services. Thank you, thanks. Yep. So um, here's the executive summary slide. And I'll try to go through this um, so we can get through to the to the rates. But this represents kind of a histogram of expected increases. So if you were to stay in the plan that you're in for FY22, each of these um, bars along that x-axis represents the premium increase, the full cost premium increase that you would have if you stayed in your plan. And the height of the bar is the number of subscribers for the GIC that are um, in that plan during uh, this current fiscal year, FY22. So you can see in the far left, there's a huge spike and that's the Unicare OME plan for uh, Medicare retirees. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically the, the yellow kind of square shows you that about 62% of the uh, GIC enrollees would be expected to have a rate change of 5% or less if they stayed in their plan. Um, and then a very small proportion in the far right of this histogram would, um, you know, have increases that are 10%. Overall, looking at the weighted average increase across all non-Medicare and Medicare plans, the premium increase is 5.4% for FY23 over FY22. And, you know, the previous year that was 5.2%. I think the year before that it was 5.1%. So this represents the, the third year um, where the average increase is over 5%. I'll pause there for any questions before we move on. Well, go ahead, Eileen. I see your hand is up. Thank you. Um, Vince, I'm not sure I'm understanding this graph and, and, and that I would assume that everyone's rates go up at the same rate, right? When you're purchasing in, in, in a group. So I, I don't know if you could try to explain this again for me because I'm not quite getting it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, the the entire GIC subscriber population is currently enrolled in different plans, and we develop premiums for each of those plans separately. So the percentage change in the premium for members of that plan will be different from plan to plan uh, right. for both non-Medicare and Medicare. So this histogram is meant to say, oh, if you stay with your plan, um, you know, you fall into one of these buckets based on what the premium increase and your contribution increase, since that's a percentage of premium, are expected to go up. 
So, you know, looking, for example, at the 7% bar, about 30,000 subscribers are in plans today where, the, where their expected premium increase will be 7%. Um, that might be a mix of different people in different plans. So do these bars actually represent the different plan offerings? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, it, yeah, that, so there are people um, who might be in different plans that get bracketed into these bars, but I think it'll be more clear when we look at the list of plan premiums and the counts of enrollees that are in those plans and what increases they're facing, sort of how they end up getting mapped to these different bars. But yeah, it's not not too helpful because it doesn't have the plan name here, right? Um, it's really a mix of folks in different plans for each of these bars. Any other questions or we can move on? I think we can move on. Uh, thanks, Eileen. Go ahead, Vince. Yep, sure. So here's the, the first set of premiums which will be put to a vote at the end of this section. This represents the non-Medicare plans and they're outlined uh, similar to last year looking at sort of lowest cost to highest costs as we go down the table. They're bracketed by sort of the regional plans, h &E and Always, followed by the narrow or limited network offerings, um, Community Choice, Tough Spirit, and Harvard Peer and Primary Choice, uh, the broad-based PPO plans, plus Navigator and Independence, and finally the National Indemnity Plans. Uh, so what is shown here is the enrollment by tier, which is the projected enrollment, and, and those are the numbers that kind of map to that previous slide. Um, based on the percentage increase that the plan would have in the last column here, which is which is shown, um, you know, um, ranging from you know six point three percent for H and E all the way down to three percent for you know Care Basic. So the, the highest increase again is ten point three percent for Always. The lowest is for uh, you know Care Basic with CIC at three percent. And Community Choice continues to represent the lowest cost product, and we'll see a lineup of sort of the, the premiums and uh, the magnitude of those premiums on the next slide. And that's followed by Health New England. Uh, one, one point oh, um, going back is that the CIC share, so that's the catastrophic um, illness coverage benefit, um, that's actually going to be decreasing for um, 23, uh, based on the fact that the medical portion of the premiums for that Unicare plan uh, that's actually decreasing from FY22 to 23. So it's really you know pharmacy that's offsetting that and leading to an overall increase in those in those rates. But that 100% uh, paid portion of the premium to trip the benefits to 100% level is actually decreasing slightly. Any questions on these rates before we move on? I don't okay. see any. I think we can move on. Fence. So here is um, a chart that basically uh, you know, looks at the rates by plan for individual coverage, individual tier coverage, and it's sorted by the level of their FY23 rate. So on the far left, you could see the Unicare uh, Community Choice, and on the far right, Unicare Basic Indemnity Plan with CIC. Generally speaking, you know the, the regional and the limited network plans are on the left, and the broad-based PPO plans and the indemnity plans are on the right. So to the extent, you know, the increase for FY23 for the plan you're in today isn't, um, you know, isn't ideal. You could shop and potentially move to a comparable value plan, comparable actuarial value plan at a lower premium level. On the next slide, um, you know, the family rates are shown. Can you go to the next one? Oh, here we go. And on the following slide, I believe we have some illustrative contributions. So assuming that the non-Medicare premium rates are, are voted in as proposed, this chart outlines the um, percent premium um, share ranging from 10 to 25%, as we saw earlier, and what that would mean for the contributions for just the medical and pharmacy benefits. So it doesn't include anything related to life or dental or vision or any um, additional municipality admin fees. And that 
I believe concludes the non-Medicare section. If we move on to the Medicare premiums, um, you know, what we what we see for Medicare is pretty modest, low single digit increases. The overall average increase, which is really driven by Unicare OME at 1.2%. Um, the average across all the plans is 1.8%. Uh, the highest increase is for um, Tufts Medicare Preferred and the h and &E Med Sub Plan at 3.9%. Now the, you know, the Medicare plans are typically trending at a lower level. They really represent the you know, fill-in of um, traditional Medicare cost-sharing components because the MedSup plans cover what Medicare doesn't cover. And typically what we see is um, you know, fee schedules also that trend lower than commercial um, rates. And as a result, we've had pretty modest increases in these plan premiums for the last several years. And again, consistent with non-Medicare, that CIC contribution for the Unicare OME plan is actually decreasing slightly um, due to um, lower medical component of the full premium cost. Any questions on the Medicare proposed premium rates? I don't see any. All right, moving on. Similar to non-Medicare, we've outlined potential contributions for the Medicare plans, assuming the rates are voted in, uh, ranging from 10% to premium to 25%. Again, this is just for the medical and pharmacy components. And that, that concludes uh, my prepared materials. And I, I believe um, now we can have a discussion and, and move to a vote. Thank you, Vince. Appreciate you running through that. Um, I think now we would entertain any questions and uh, otherwise move to the vote. Yeah, I don't. I don't see any questions, and I do hear, you know, both the staff and Vince uh, letting us know that uh, you know these these rates, uh, while not ideal. Uh, they may be lower than uh, in other areas, uh, but, you know, I do want to recognize that, uh, you know, families uh, are struggling with some of these rates and to the degree that our procurement for the next five years uh, can try to stabilize, keep consistent, reduce uh, the out-of-pocket costs, you know, whether it's the premiums which are out of pocket or the copays. So, uh, you know, I think all of us have been in healthcare for a while. We've seen this show play out. Uh, I'd love for us to find a way to be the most innovative buyer of health insurance uh, and, and put that into practice, use our clout for, uh, you know, for the next procurement. Um, but that's not what we're voting on today, I know. Uh, so at this point, I'll entertain a motion uh, to approve uh, these cost premiums as shown on slides 37 and 41. So moved. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. All right, terrific. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll vote approved uh, and I'll move this over to our General Counsel for a roll call. Uh, Vice Chair Kaplan. Um, yes, I'll vote to approve, but I just, I did want to make a comment, which um, sort of to piggyback on, on what Valerie said, um, you know, the state employees, um, their increases, which are not always annual increases are much less than these rates. So, you know, even though let's say Harvard um, is above inflation, um, above the inflation rate, I mean, it's still, even though 3% increase for people is more than their salary increases. So everybody is treading water and going backwards. And I just, you know, we, you know, sort of have to take that into consideration uh, because, um, 
people are just not doing well. And I just wanted, even though I do intend to, you know, vote yes for the raids, it's it's um, very concerning. So I do vote yes. Uh, does any uh, Roder? Yes. Does any Butler? Yes. Commissioner Shabbat? Yes. Commissioner Choate? Yes. Commissioner Kleinard? I believe she had to leave early because of a prior commitment. Thank you, Manager. Commissioner Davis? Aye. Commissioner Gentile? Yes. Commissioner McEnany? Yes, but I would also like to offer a comment just to the point of comparison. Um, in the small group market, we're looking at increases year over year of 10% or more. So just important um, to understand the relative differences in, in, in the market. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Murphy Rodriguez? Yes. Commissioner Sullivan? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Sinenko? Yes. And Commissioner Garand? Yes. Uh, the vote passes unanimously. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the commission um, for that vote. Um, I, I wanna acknowledge um, some members of the team who've put a tremendous amount of work into this effort as, as the timeline and of process that, that Vince laid out earlier in the deck here shows this is work that begins back in September um, and really comes to a crescendo last week. So we had um, a number of members of our team that I just want to acknowledge who were working very, very hard to bring this all together uh, for you and for us. So I want to acknowledge Jim Rust, uh, our CFO, uh, Vince Kane from Willis Towers Watson, also on Jim's team, Cameron McBean, Janine Dewar, Margaret Anschutz, Catherine Moore, and Margaret Byrne. And also just want to acknowledge the work of the health plans um, and the commitment to getting us the information that we need to produce these rates for you. So just want to acknowledge all of those people for their hard work. And just to echo your comments, Madam Chair, <clears throat> These, these are numbers that, um, that we know represent um, challenges to our members, particularly those of limited income and those on, on fixed pensions. So we keep that very much um, uh, at the center of our thinking and considerations as we go through this work. So thank you. All right, well, thank you. Thanks to everybody. And just, I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the work that is right behind this. And it's a tremendous amount of work on the operation side and the communication side to turn this into uh, materials for our members that they'll need for annual enrollment, including the benefit decision guide. So Paul Murphy, uh, Donna Wartman and, and the rest of, of, of their teams as well. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. I, I agree. This really is um, work that goes across the whole organization as much as the work does. And with that, we have one more rate and we appreciate you um, working through all this with us. I know it's a, a very, a very dense meeting. Um, this is the, this is the municipal administrative fee rate. If we go to the next slide, please. So the, so staff recommends that we set the municipal administrative fee rate to 0.3% of the full cost premiums. Um, this is actually a reduction in the percentage rate that we'll be charging the municipalities for this, for this administrative fee to cover our expenses um, administering this program. Um, you, you may recall from, from prior years that there is, there is a ceiling as to the amount of revenue that we can collect in this, on this fee. So this is, this is basically us um, recalibrating the fee so we don't over collect the revenue. So we have a, we have a legislative capital about 2.2 million, which is enough to cover our expenses around this program. So we are adjusting the percentage fee downward in order to, to meet that goal as premiums go up, the percentage fee 
um, should go down occasionally to to recalibrate that equation. So that's what we're doing here by reducing the rate. Um, all and, and the reminder: all municipalities pay this fee, and um, we would entertain a motion to approve the setting of this fee at this rate. So moved. Uh, wait a minute, I didn't ask for a motion. Um, but I, I do see that there's no other questions, so I can ask for a motion to authorize the GIC to set the fiscal year um, ad, administrative fee to 0.3% of full cost premiums. Do I have a motion? I thought I did. So moved. Second. Okay, second, excellent. So I approve. I like that we're reducing uh, the fee. So yeah, municipalities who are watching, join us. <laughs> go, uh, go, Andrew. Take take the vote, please. Vice Chair Kaplan. Yes. Commissioner Roder. Yes. Or Designee Roder. I'm sorry. Designee Butler. Rebecca. You're to be on mute. Yeah. Rebecca. I'll move on, come back. Uh, Commissioner Chabot. Yes. Commissioner uh, Choate. Yes. Commissioner Kleinod. Uh, She's left early. Andrew. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Lots to keep track of. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Gentile. Yes. Commissioner McEnany? Aye. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Murphy Rodriguez? Yes. Commissioner Tim Sullivan? Yes. Commissioner Sinenko? Yes. And uh, Commissioner Garand? Yes. Uh, is Designee Butler joined us? Yes, I'm sorry, I couldn't get off mute. I, I apologize, there's something happening with my computer. Uh, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, the vote is unanimous. Terrific. I, I would like to see more municipalities uh, be focused on as we go into our procurement because they'll gain tremendous benefits. And so I applaud uh, while, the, while it's a minor tweak, I, I think it shows that we do value our municipalities and want them to get the best value from the work we do. And we absolutely hear that, that we do give that. So um, let's get the word out there to other municipalities for the upcoming procurement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the commission for all of those uh, rate related votes and um, the operations team and comms team will jump right in and translate these into materials. So thank you all for that. Um, moving on here to agenda item six, uh, our employee, employee assistance program procurement consultant update. And I'll turn it over uh, to Janine Dewar, the manager of pharmacy and uh, ancillary benefits. Um, the management of our EAP vendor in this procurement is among Janine's new responsibilities, and I'm glad to say she's jumped right in with both feet. Um, I do wanna say that this is the beginning of the process, and today what we wanna do, provide you a little bit of background information and essentially inform you that we'll be back in June for a vote to proceed with the consultant uh, that we'll be bringing on to assist us here. I certainly don't want to short circuit any discussion, and I know there is a good deal of interest uh, in this topic, but the vast majority of our thinking and our work on this is still to come, and we're likely uh, not to have a whole lot to say today um, about where we want to take this program. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Janine. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, next slide, please. So since FY19, Optum has administered the mass for You employee assistance program. Um, the duration of the contract was for three years with two options to renew for one year. Uh, we are currently in year four and plan to renew for a fifth year, which will end on June 30th, 2023. So while we approach the final year of the contract, the GIC seeks to procure an EAP consultant to assist with the procurement and implementation of the FY24 employee assistance program. An EAP consultant should be able to assist us with strategies for 
increasing utilization, developing communications, and coordinating benefits with those currently offered through the GIC plans um, and HRD. Next slide, please. So mass for you is available to all active employees eligible for GIC benefits and their dependents. Benefits include three free therapy sessions per year, unlimited access to chat with master's level clinicians over the phone and online, access to the Live and Work Well uh, EAP website, behavioral health applications like Sanbello and Talkspace, and services that assist with work-life needs. It also includes access to legal and financial services and a confidential substance use disorder hotline. So this slide shows the top 10 presenting reasons um, sorry, top five presenting reasons for those who utilize MasterU and the utilization data for FY21. Next slide, please. There are also benefits available to coordinators, including access to trainings for staff, critical incidents response, response management consultations, and monthly communications. In FY21, Optum assisted with coordinating 162 trainings and the top five attended trainings are listed here. Next slide, please. As Matt mentioned, um, this presentation is only to inform the commission of our intent to procure. We'd be prepared to ask commissioners to vote on an EAP consultant um, during the June 16th meeting. And then in September, we plan to update the commission on the EAP, EAP procurement, and we would be ready to ask for a vote on the EAP vendor. Um, in October. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Janine, does the vendor give us any data on why utilization is so low? I mean, less than 1% of utilization just seems uh, untenable. There's always an effort to increase utilization. I think. Um, a lot of the reasoning has been just spreading the word, um, just people being aware of it. Um, with the pandemic, we weren't able to um, have efforts like showing up outside of the cafeteria um, at Ashburton to you know, handle flyers and things like that. Um, and we do send emails every month uh, through the coordinators. And I mean, we really do want to get utilization up. So I think a big part of this upcoming procurement um, for a consultant, we would be looking into how we can improve okay. on that front. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, thanks. I was just uh, to clear to put it in context. Do you know what like benchmark utilization is at other, you know, similar firms or large firms? I mean, it might just be a lower level than we think is needed, so it should go up. But I was just curious. Off the top of my head, I don't have that information, but I can get back to you. Hey, Toby, I see you have your hand up. Sure, I mean, I would make the uh, request that in evaluating whether we need a consultant, make sure that that consultant obviously puts on the table of not doing this and using the money for something else, as opposed to, and so make sure that they can make that type of evaluation versus just say, which one of a bad lot we ought to go with. Mm -hmm. Nice. I think that's a great suggestion, Toby. Thank you. Hey, Bobby, I see you have your hand up also. Yes. Um, this is, uh, you know, the pandemic, two years, right, of the pandemic had a lot to do with. So I think utilization, not that utilization was that high beforehand, but um, I think many employees um, are are, um, uh, let's say, um, don't trust the fact that uh, the employer will, you know, <laughs> that it's confidential and the employer will not know, right? And so I, I think that that's a factor. And the other factor is that people are, you know, typically not inclined because people think of EAP, sort of they equate it with mental health services um, as opposed to the other services that Mass4U offers. 
And there's a stigma attached to, you know, mental health. So, um, so I think people are reluctant, I would say, to do this because it's offered sort of, you know, through the workplace, even though it's not really related to the workplace. So I think it's about trying to figure out what the, um, uh, you know, what's going to capture, right, people's attention and, and how they view any employee assistance program. Because I believe in prior years before we had, uh, before we contracted with Optum, any EAP um, program that we had, the utilization was historically low. Um, and so I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, no, um, thanks, Bobby. I, I think you're hitting on some points that are, uh, you know, important for us to keep in mind. Hey, Tim, I see that you have your hand up as well. I do. Thank you. Um, as, as the process moves forward, one thing that I would really be interested in taking a look at is exactly what the GIC has done to advertise um, the components of this program. I know it was mentioned earlier, uh, you email your coordinators um, monthly. Just because you email the coordinators doesn't necessarily mean that the coordinators are sending it on to the members. So maybe we should be emailing our members monthly so that they're getting it directly in their hands. And a couple of comments have been made about potentially removing this particular program. I would not be in favor of removing any of these components unless there was another way to provide those services because it is all about our members. Thank you. That's a good point. Um, thank you for bringing up um the possibility of emailing directly to the employees. Uh, there have been some challenges in accessing those uh, email addresses, but that's something that I hope we can um, overcome in the near future. Okay, yeah. and, and, and we do. Need help, I was just gonna say, if you need help from our side, who, those of us who have constituents that you can't reach for some reason, let us know and we'll see what we can do on our end. Yeah. Thank you. That would be really helpful, Tim. And that's uh, Commissioner Sullivan. And I would say, you know, we do email our members directly um, about the EAP. When we when we email coordinators, we do also email our members. I think Janine rightly points out that, you know, we don't have email addresses as a matter of course from, you know, a substantial number of our members. Um, the introduction of our member portal does present the opportunity to to make some significant headway there, um, but we will definitely take you up on your offer and others to uh, look for all kinds of other um, channels to get the word out about the EAP. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Bobby, is that your hand uh, for- uh, Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. Yes, it is, Valerie. I just, I wanted to echo what Tim said about the GIC coordinators, you know, they, are, you know, <laughs> they don't always, um, uh, you know, disseminate the information to everyone. And a lot of our members are out in the field and they don't get it. They're just, you know, because it's sent to their work email as opposed to their home email, which, you know, sometimes is unknown. Um, and, and um, you know, if we could capture the home email um, addresses, it might be better because people won't feel that it's work related, you know, or their employer, because people have a sense that, you know, the employer, which, you know, daily is looking at everybody's email, which really is not true, but, but um, if we could send, send this information to people's personal email addresses, they may feel that it's less or connected less to the workplace um, because we have to think of a different way. And I'd be curious, what was the utilization pre-pandemic? What was the utilization before we contracted with Optum? Because 
in as far as I know, utilization for employee assistance programs has just historically been low. And I, uh, you know, I think that Optum has done a really good job. Um, but people are reluctant and it's about trying to figure a way to get over that. Um, and do we you know, need to do things differently? Yeah. I don't know that it's about the services that are provided. I think it's more about, you know, maybe the marketing of, yeah. of this. Yeah, good points, Bobby. So uh, I know we're running a little bit behind schedule. Uh, this is all good conversation on EAP. We will look forward to uh, a June 16th conversation uh, that is a little more in depth maybe on the EAP because you can see commissioners are uh, interested in this uh, deployment of resources and making sure we're getting uh, our, our, our members constituents the use they deserve. So let's let's move on. We appreciate this information and the hard work that's going into this. And thank you, Janine, uh, for stepping up and taking on this new uh, responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, thank you, Janine. Uh, move on to the last uh, substantive <clears throat> item on our agenda, item seven, the procurement rules uh, overview. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, and I'll turn it over to Andrew uh, to walk us through the rules that govern this important process, which is what we will uh, be spending most of our time and energy on in the months ahead. Andrew? Thank you. Why don't we go to the next slide? Um, the commissioners will recall that um, we've discussed the procurement process, um, the commission's role, in the process, the interaction of open meeting law and public records law on a number of occasions. In fact, we dedicated a series of commission meetings to these topics back in 2019. So I am anticipating this as being just a high level uh, refresher um, and I'll try to move through it quickly. Um, we did circulate a, a memo back in December, 2020 uh, to refresher as well. Um, that was particularly focused on uh, the recommendation pro uh, process vote um, so I hope you still have that. Um, as you know, we contract for five years um, by statute. We can't go any longer. And that means that we're running procurements all the time. Uh, we, I think in today's meeting, we've mentioned at least four. We'll be running, I believe, five procurements in the next 12 months, uh, two of which are very voluminous. Um, it's our expectation that commissioners provide feedback and strat uh, on strategy and uh, things like the EAP discussion we just had before we get to writing an RFR. But to ensure a competitive process that's free of undue influence, um, the, the process itself, the procurement itself is confidential. And within that window of confidentiality, the, the commission gets asked to render the ultimate decision on who is the apparent successful bidder and we present a recommendation to that effect to you. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So procurements are governed by both statute regulation and uh, a series of best practices and guidance from the Operational Services Division, uh, OSD. Uh, any contract that we're contemplating that is looks to be like it's going to be more than $10,000 requires us to run a competitive procurement. Um, technically, the procurement process begins with a posting of the RFR and ends once I have a negotiated contract. The timeline on the bottom of this slide uh, represents the blackout period. That's the period when uh, the procurement team is working in isolation, it's comp their work is confidential and cannot be disclosed outside of the team. Um, let's, uh, and as, as the prior slide noted, um, the, the feedback, the time for feedback on the procurement is before we go to the blackout period. Um, and you'll also note that the vote for the apparent successful bidder that you make is within the blackout period. And that's where we always have this awkwardness of having to go out to a public meeting um, where we're discussing something that's within the context of a confidential process. So 
we always have to be mindful that documents related to that are, are confidential and that the discussion that we have in the public meeting, um, while it needs to be fulsome, also has to keep in mind that I still have to negotiate contracts on the back end. And we don't want to um, put ourselves in a position where uh, we undermine contracting. You'll recall that we had a situation not too long ago where we didn't reach uh, a successful contract with the apparent successful bidder and had to move to another bidder. And disclosures can become problematic in that case. Um, Vice Chair Kaplan, do you have a question? Oh, sorry, I didn't put my hand down. Sorry about that. No problem. Why don't we move to the next slide? Um, OSD uh, provides a number of materials for um, what they call the strategic sourcing team, which we refer to as the procurement team, uh, to use in drafting procurements. And uh, one of the things that they recommend is that every team member sign an agreement that is essentially an NDA or a confidentiality agreement. And it's to remind everyone what they're buying into when they get on the procurement team. And it's required to maintain the impartiality and the fairness and integrity of the process. The quotes that you see on this slide are uh, taken from that agreement. They're little pieces of that agreement. And those are the, the main things they cover. The, the conflict of interest. If, if anyone who's on the team has to make sure they don't have a conflict of interest with the subject matter or any of the potential bidders, that the process is confidential, that the documents that are generated through the procurement process, including emails, scoring sheets, and, and the procurement materials themselves are confidential. Uh, and that public records protects this. Um, it, it, there's an exception to the public records law that keeps this material confidential until after the contract is, is finalized. Um, there is a possibility that a procurement team will need to go outside the team for either a sub, to talk to subject matter experts or to uh, make sure that where they're headed fits within the strategic objectives of the department, the agency, um, and in our case, the commission. Um, so there is the opportunity to share information outside of the procurement team, but that the people that are the information is being shared with, it's recommended also sign a confidentiality agreement. It's this is just again to emphasize that fairness is critical to the success of the procurement process, and it's important to remind everyone involved what their role is, and this, these agreements confirm that. Um, let's move to the next slide. This is just um, a reminder that open meeting law and the public records law um, take into account the procurement process. Public records law has the exception I just mentioned uh, that keeps the documents confidential. An open meeting law allows us to share information with the commission for informational purposes um, as so long as there's no deliberations uh, regarding that information. Let's move on. So summaries of the high level points are that um, procurements are different than the other work we do with the, with the commission in the sense that it's the only thing we do that has sort of this blackout period and we can't really talk to you about in a public meeting about what we're doing um, while it's ongoing, uh, that it, this is a confidential and protected process and that public records are, uh, protects the documentation surrounding it, um, that until the bid is awarded, our staff um, and any commissioner who is privy to information can't discuss it um, with people outside of uh, the team or those who have signed a confidentiality agreement. Um, uh, in light of this, we, uh, to enhance the, our ability to communicate with commission, we uh, have modeled on the uh, sourcing team document, developed a non-disclosure agreement for commissioners to use so that we can provide you with information beyond 
what you've been getting in the past during the course of the, of the procurement process. A sample of what that agreement looks like was included in materials sent to you uh, before the commission meeting. Um, let's move on to the uh, next slide. So this is, a, you can call it an NDA, you can call it a confidentiality agreement, um, but it's a tool that we want to use to be able to communicate. It's voluntary. I um, have modeled it on that sourcing agreement. Um, I will, I've made uh, it available. I can make it available through Adobe Sign so that any commissioner who's interested in receiving materials will have the opportunity to sign. These will be tailored for each procurement separately. So every procurement will have an, its own agreement. Um, just like the sourcing teams for each procurement has to sign an agreement for that particular appointment. They're tailored specifically to the procurement that's ongoing. Um, and when we meet in person, we won't have to use Adobe Sign, but at this point being remote, um, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, so uh, following this meeting uh, in the next few days, I will send out the first of these, um, which it, uh, will be for the health uh, plan procurement. Um, we will have, be having the uh, pharmacy procurements quickly following, and I'll send out another one for that. Um, I will, anyone who is interested can sign and return it. Um, and if anybody has a technical issue, please let me know. Um, does anyone have any questions regarding this or any of the rules regarding the procurement process? I don't see any. Uh, oh, I see Bobby just put her hand up. Go ahead, Bobby. Yes, I have a question about the. So if, um, if we were to sign or if a commissioner were to sign this um, NDA, um, would we be we would be able to discuss it with other members who have other commissioners who have signed it? Not in, in public, I get it, but you know. No, also under open meeting law, okay. if a mm -hmm. um, if a if there is a discussion among a quorum of commissioners, we would you would run into trouble on any topic, whether it be the procurement or or anything that the commission is doing that is not in a public meeting. Yeah. So um, this is really uh, viewed as a tool for you to discuss with, with staff um, and, and the team or the executive director, um, uh, not so much as a means of, of having a discussion about the procurement outside of the, the, the uh, public meeting process. Okay, so it, it's any discussion, right, that um, uh, sort of emanates from, you know, reviewing the, these materials would be with GIC staff, not, not um, other commissioners, correct? Correct. Okay, I just, want, and that, and any discussion would not be Right, it would be outside of a commission meeting. Correct. Right. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I understood it. Thank you. But Andrew, to clarify, or to maybe uh, ask Bobby's question a different way, if Bobby and I wanted to just talk about, you know, maybe she had some questions um, about what was sent out on information regarding uh, a topic that's going to be covered at a meeting. Um, we're not at quorum, so we do have the ability to talk um, regardless of an NDA in place. It's when a small group of commissioners outside of GIC talk and make quorum that it's a violation of open meeting laws. Am I tracking that appropriately? Yes, think about it as putting aside the procurement process itself, um, open meeting law applies and open meeting law uh, defines deliberation as, as discussions between a quorum of members or serial discussions that result in discussions between a quorum, quorum of members. So yes, you and Bobby, you and, and the uh, vice chair could, could have a discussion on anything um, and it wouldn't be a deliberation under open meeting law. 
And we're signing this NDA to say, not only will we not violate open meeting laws, although that is regardless of an NDA, but we won't uh, take the information we learn about the procurement and go outside of our uh, GIC uh, discussions, whether it's commissioners or staff. Am I tracking appropriately? Yes. So any, any documents that are sent as informational documents to update cannot be redisclosed um, to anyone. Um, anyone with a constituency, you know, you're, you, if you're receiving information and having to asking questions of the procurement team, um, that has to be kept uh, confidential so that you can go out and discuss it with a constituency. Um, that's, I, th I think that's pretty clear. All right. Well, great. Well, as you said, Andrew, this was review from when we spent a significant amount of time uh, a couple of years ago uh, discussing all the rules and regulations that the state has in place for procurement. So appreciate the refresher. Uh, it's very helpful. And I really like the idea of an NDA. So appreciate you bringing this up to, you know, up our game here on the commission. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Andrew. Um, what we're trying to do here is balance some really important obligations of the commission. Um, um, certainly following um, state law and regulations and best practice, but we also want to make sure that we are providing an opportunity to adequately inform our commissioners so that you can make an informed decision when it actually comes time to the vote at the end of the process. So what I would suggest is, you know, if, if, if commissioners have questions about the NDA, as you review it, please be in touch with Andrew about details there. Even after you sign it, if circumstances arise where you're not sure um, about conversations and whether they comply with the NDA, um, also be in touch with Andrew. Um, I think we're here to be helpful to you to make sure that we all do our jobs um, aligned with the requirements here and protect the integrity of the procurement. So um, we're happy to assist you in that in any way. Thank you. Appreciate that. And again, I applaud the efforts to uh, keep our, our board in full compliance uh, with everything we've pledged to the state. So thank you. With that, Madam Chair, we come to the end of our formal business. If there's other business, uh, we're happy to um, hear about that um, or just move to adjournment. All right, well, as a reminder, uh, our next meeting is on March 24th. I know this conflicts uh, with maybe one or two commissioners, other responsibilities, uh, apologize for the inconvenience uh, but it's an important meeting uh, to keep the cadence of, uh, of the GIC moving forward. Uh, like that we don't have an April meeting, again, to be efficient. So I uh, you know, applaud the staff for uh, hearing from uh, commissioners that uh, we want to use our time efficiently. We don't need uh, monthly meetings if there's nothing to discuss of meaningful uh, need uh, from, from uh, commissioners. So thank you. Um, so we'll see you all in March. Uh, before we adjourn right on time, I do want to express, and I know uh, everyone shares this, our, 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 our empathy, our caring for uh, any colleagues uh, that are constituents or just even all of our colleagues who may have family over in Ukraine. So I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the difficulty my heart is with them. I know others share it. So uh, I know it's the obvious and it's what we're hearing, but uh, my prayers are with anyone who's, uh, who's dealing with this issue and uh, hope it's resolved quickly. So with that, this meeting is adjourned. Uh, we'll see you uh, 
right after uh, the full moon in March. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.